Hi, Anna. Hi, everybody. This is Anna Hack with Green Sisterhood, and I'm here with Karen Lee, also of Green Sisterhood, and Sass Brown. And Sass Brown, we're we're so excited to have you, Sass. I have to tell you, Sass is an author of Refashioned and Echo Fashion, and she's also the Assistant Dean of the School of Arts and Science of Fashion Institute of Technology. And what we're going to be talking today with Sass about is ethical fashions. Everybody knows that the holidays are coming up. And you know, instead of grabbing that two dollar sweater, we're going to talk a little bit about what you really should be looking at in the way of buying clothes. So, Sass, I'm going to hold on one second. Okay, here we go. Sass, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you've seen over the years with fashion. I mean, you are the authority on ethical fashion. Well, thank you. Um, well, it's a, a growing field of, of fashion and it's becoming more and more mainstream in terms of conscious consumerism, ethical buying, designers utilizing lots of different um, ecologically uh, friendly materials or processes, working with fair trade. So there are a, a number of different expressions of eco-fashion. And what I write about are those different expressions. So my last book, Refashioned, was all about designers working specifically with recycled materials, so wasted materials, whether they were pre or post-consumer waste. And tell us about your first book. The first book, Eco-Fashion, was sort of big picture eco fashion so it talked about designers working with organic materials, uh, recycled materials, new business models, fair trade, um, sustainable development and also um, different uh, fashion initiatives so companies that weren't necessarily considered ethical or ecological but had undertaken a particular initiative, a particular collection, a particular grouping that did exemplify some of those or one of those um, concepts. So when you when you writ, wrote these books, did you see the other side of fashion? You know, because oh, I mean, you've been in the fashion world a long time. I have, <laughs> I have. Yeah, I come from mainstream fashion, so I was. Uh, it, design director for several major high street retailers, particularly at the junior end of the market, who are really the fast fashion retailers. So yes, I have seen the other side. I do know the wastage that goes on. I do know um, the the race to the bottom. How do you get things cheaper, faster, and all of the things that make fashion so, um, so unsustainable. So yes, I have seen that. <laughs> so what would you say is the ugly side of fashion? Because a lot of people just don't look at it that way. They look at like, you know, I can get the cheapest price for something mm -hmm. that I need. So what do people really need to know when they go in a department store? I think that there is what we call the hidden price tag of fast fashion um, or cheap fashion in general. It doesn't have to be fashion, but apparel, clothing, cheap. There's a cost to it. And if the cost is not at the checkout, if you're not paying a considerable amount for your clothing, then the cost is either at um, the cost of the planet in terms of uh, pollution and so on, or it's the cost of the people producing, whether it's the fiber or the clothing or one part of the process. I mean, I think probably the series of three disasters in Bangladesh in the last year alone have done a particularly good job, if that's not the right way to put it, but of of showcasing that there is a cost to cheap fashion and that may not be realized at the checkout but it is realized by the people who produce our clothing and that's just simply not fair and I think the reality is if most people were aware of the cost, the real cost of producing that clothing, the cost to our planet, to our rivers, to our soil, to the people producing it, they wouldn't be paying five dollars for a t-shirt. They would be making much more ethical choices. So let's get a little bit, a lot of people don't really know like what happened in Bangladesh. They don't know what's happening to our waterways. So let's drill it down as, as, as sure. simplistic as possible so that people could say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this was happening. Yeah. So tell us about what happened in Bangladesh that you well, were referring to. Sure, there's been a series of three disasters in the past year, the largest of which has been the Rana Plaza, the... Um, uh, and the building collapse and the fire. So um, the fire 
was I think 127 people died. These are all manufacturing, fashion manufacturing plants in Bangladesh, which is a major supplier of fast fashion and cheap clothing because of the cost of living, because of the lack of unionization, because of the lack of regulations in terms of production. So many of the major high street brands produce in Bangladesh, amongst many other countries. Um, it just happens that there's been this series of three terrible disasters in Bangladesh, which to together, between the three of them in the period of a year, have caused the deaths of over 2,500 people. Um, okay. Actually, I'm sorry, the maiming, and, and that's actually the number that have been maimed and injured, and the death of over 1,000 which is just incredible numbers. These are people, these are labels that are producing their every high street brand that you can think of that produces fast fashion. And this is the real cost of fast fashion. So yes, you do may only pay 10 bucks for a pair of jeans from whichever high street label. I don't want to single out names because this isn't a single brand's problem. This is a, a, a mainstream fashion industry problem. Um, so the cost of that is considerable in terms of people's well-being, in terms of people's life, in terms of, of uh, pollution is another issue. Um, detox campaign that Greenpeace just recently published this within the last year again highlights multiple high street brands who are polluting through their dyeing processes in Indonesia. Indonesia, one of the most beautiful countries in the world when you think of, of uh, uh, you know, unspoilt beaches and waterways and so on and it's being devastated by textile production because they don't have the regulations in place and sadly um, that leaves the doors open for mass companies to take advantage and say, well, you know, we won't put the safeguards in place to protect their waterways because we're not being required to do so. And it's much cheaper if we don't. So, you know, what the heck if we're polluting somebody else's environment? What do we care? So um, it's really quite, you know, the fashion industry or the clothing industry is a massive employer. When you think of all of the different aspects to garment production, from uh, agriculture and crop growing through to chemical processing, through to finishing, weaving, picking, knitting, sewing, shipping, and retailing and then the consumer use of clothing through washing and so on, that impacts an enormous number of people. It employs an enormous number of people. And if we clean up this industry, it, imp it impacts our planet on a massive scale, as well as the way that we conduct business, the way we consume. So it's a potential change agent for massive change in all of those different arenas. So when you talk about all these disasters, mm -hmm. what was the, the response from the fashion industry, especially the, the cheap fashion that you're speaking about? What was their response? Like, oh, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> it just, it's, it Very just seems... Mixed. Yeah, I mean, the, the out, what came out of these last two disasters, because they were to so significant, was something called the Bangladesh Safety Accord, um, which is a group of... Um, foundations of uh, NGOs and other agencies getting together to put together this accord or agreement of liability for those that choose to do their production there, a liability and a legal ramification for not taking care of the people and the place that they're producing their garments in. There have been many important signatories, I think there's somewhere in the region of 40 or more, many of whom, sadly I'm afraid to say, are European. There are very few American signatories on that uh, document. Wow. There's a major hold out of of companies like The Gap, of Walmart, of Target, major producers in Bangladesh who refuse to sign this agreement. They're all saying very nice things about, um, well, we have our own uh, certifications and processes in place to do things. But this is a document that holds them legally responsible, and that is why they're refusing to sign it. And that is why um, they haven't. That said, one of the, the very first signatory of the Bangladesh Agreement was Primark. Now, you may not be so familiar with that name because they're a British brand, but they are 
one of the cheapest high street supermarket type uh, garment producers and they were the first signatory in the UK. These are This would be the equivalent, the British equivalent of, of Walmart is what Primark is in terms of cost, the cheapest of the cheap. They're a high street supermarket chain that also sells clothing and they were the first people to sign. So it goes to show that you know it can be done, people can commit at that level of, of mass product and still maintain um, a cost effective product but take care of the people that are producing the garments. H&M I think was the second uh, company to respond yet again another European label but the Americans have been sadly remiss in this is there a list of, of who signed and who hasn't signed absolutely yes um, where, where would you find that uh, let me see labor behind the label or the clean clothes campaign probably the clean clothes campaign they're both um, activistic foundations that transmit information about uh, the state of our garment industry worldwide uh, Labor Behind the Label is a not-for-profit that communicates and coordinates global labor standards around the world and communicates um, about the failings of companies within that arena. So they're all quite clearly listed there. Um, Karen, you know, you did a, a very important interview with an author that, that I'm sure Sass knows. You want to elaborate with Sass about, about your interview? Um, we... Uh... When I was with uh, um, when I was with Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth Klein, and I knew it was who you were going to say Elizabeth. Yeah, yes, and um, I love her work. Yeah, I, when I was with her down in um, Eileen Fisher's uh, store mm -hmm. when she was doing her book signing, I got to mm -hmm. talk to her and I listened to her uh, to her story. Um, and and you know, as you know, Eileen Fisher is, has been you know a, or a forefront at Absolutely. this ethical fashion and slow fashion. And I was really intrigued by. Elizabeth Klein's, um, you know, uh, past history of how, and then she's just like it, you know, any other American who bought convenience, absolutely you know, right, convenience over ethical fashion, mm -hmm. or any, you know, like no one really thinks of, um, you know, this kind of issues. But what was interesting was that when I was at the workshop, because I uh, held a workshop of upcycling some of the materials in, mm -hmm. and, and making, you know, arts and crafts. Because um, that's 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 what I do on my on my uh, personal blog, uh -huh. but um, there were several FIT students who came to mm -hmm. that workshop. Um, I forget what class they were taking, but they were really into it. They made mm -hmm. the um, the items with me. I actually taught them how to make uh, t-shirt yarn. Great. You um, know, one little quick step using mm -hmm. uh, using a t-shirt. Um, and they were really, really thrilled to learn, you know, that sort of technique, which right. to me seems like such a grandmother, like an old-fashioned type of thing. But I was really impressed with their enthusiasm and, mm -hmm. and their willingness to learn this new, well, I don't want to say new, but this trend Absolutely. of ethical fashion. So I have to say that um, FIT is doing a great job of getting it out, getting the message out there and Good. teaching their students about yeah. ethical fashion and slow fashion. Now, right. do you see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of students learning and and being interested in this in this field because they really are sure. our future designers. Absolutely, absolutely. So, do you see the trend among well, the students? We do have a, a certificate program at FIT that uh, is about sustainable clothing, and the. Uh, all of that thing, all of that encompasses with the chains of logistics, CRS, all that sort of thing. Um, so we also have, there are many student-led clubs across the school. FIT is a massive school, so we have yes. uh, in excess of 10,000 students at any given time. And within that, student government have multiple different clubs that are formed and, and run by the students themselves. And I've spoken at two of them in the last matter of a couple of months. One is through the School of Business and Technology predominantly and to do with uh, sustainability in the supply chain. And the other one is the Fashion Design uh, Sustainability Club. So we do have student-led clubs that are particularly interested in gathering and disseminating and discussing uh, everything around the topic of sustainable fashion. Now, do you do you find there are uh, more classes being added towards this, or 
is that not really still taking place? Oh no, absolutely. There are more classes. There's always this is a you know this is a field that's not going away. It's only going to become right. more and more important as time comes by. So um, we have many classes across our school of art and design. As I said, we have a certificate program through our continuing education school. Um, we have a new sustainable interiors program. Um, so across multiple different disciplines, there are definitely new courses being written. Um, it's much quicker to get courses out uh, through continuing education. We're a state university, so we have multiple layers of, of approvals um, to get new curriculum through. Um, so sometimes it takes longer than we would like, but we have quite a bit in place and a lot more to come. I wish that it was a required course for any designers to take. Because, you know, I think they need to be educated before they go out and right. outsource, outsource mm -hmm. their work. Um, I know there are not too many uh, uh, American designers who have American facilities that manufacture clothes. They're still being outsourced. So it would be great if uh, these students can learn and, and, you know, it's a required, you know, it's a, one of those requirements that you have to go through. At the moment it's self-directed, but there are many options for students to participate in, whether it's as simple as attending talks and workshops, whether it's joining a club, whether it's taking a continue education class, um, whether it's taking a summer program. There are lots of options, but it is self-directed and not mandatory at this stage. A uh, question that I have is, you know, when we're talking about this, what can we tell the public? Like, what's some guidelines we could say to the public? I know it's hard to tell them, or maybe they just don't want to listen. You know, uh, when you walk into a store, what should you be looking for? Is there certain labels or tags or something that can get them to sure. start thinking about it's not just about $10? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think there are, first of all, multiple vehicles to arm yourself with knowledge. I mean, that's one of the pleasures at this stage. There are so many great blogs, e-zines, web-zines, um, any number of different, particularly digital media, where you can have fun learning about this, which are great information sites, um, but also inspirational. So in terms of finding out about designers and the aesthetics of the designers that you like and enjoy and getting to know those names, there is just so much information out there, whether it's in places like my own books or my website or any number of other magazines from or, or spaces like yourself where you know dissemination of information there's tons to learn and you find you know just as as many people follow fashion and have their favorite designers and their favorite uh, styles and trends it's just it's easy to do so through through ethical design or conscious design and it's simply a matter of, of knowing who's in that sphere and there are great resources and listings out there, everyone from Ecoterre to Eco Salon, Inhabitat, Eco Fashion Talk, my website, um, Coco Echo Magazine, um, Lily in the UK, Ethical Fashion Forum, or if you want to go to the serious side and know about the real problems in the industry, um, somewhere like the Clean Clothes Campaign or Labour Behind the Label. Greenpeace is focusing more and more on the fashion industry because it's such an important uh, issue in terms of pollution and ethical treatment of people. Um, so there are so many spaces and ways to get information to find out who's out there. And once you're part of those communities, um, there is just so many events, so many talks, so many promotions, so many websites, uh, e-commerce sites that you connect to and can uh, can access information that it you know you have more than you'll need. <laughs> But is, is there some way to know, like, even if your favorite department stores are now carrying some of those designers or they have a label that you know when you pick up a garment that you could read something and say, yeah, okay, I'm good with this, you know, that's, that's what I'm concerned with is the average right. Josephine that doesn't mm -hmm. really want to spend time looking at blogs but just wants to know, okay, where can I go, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Well, there are certainly... Um, 
e-commerce sites particularly that specialize in ethical design or components of larger sites. So for example, Ux have Uxigen, um, Net-a-Porte have a component as well that's about ethical design. Um, they have their African connection uh, collection as well. So in the e-commerce arena there are. There is there are certain brands that are carried whether in the high street or major department stores, whether those are companies like Eden or uh, uh, Nudie Jeans or any number of different brands that you can access through any number of retailers. And then there are particular bricks and mortar stores such as say Boonkey in, in uh, Brooklyn that specialize in ethical and sustainable labels. So sure, you can, you can pick a single store that you want that carries multiple brands and specializes and just, you know, go and browse and take your pick or, or browse online through an e-commerce site too. So these names that you just mentioned, are they on one particular site where you can find out who has a brick and mortar, whose who's jeans or t-shirts are being carried at, at you know, major retailers? How do you find out that information? Um, again, a lot of it lives digitally. So, for example, um, my website or Future Fashion's website have resource listings that are broken down into retail or when menswear, women's wear, or designers working with fair trade, etc. So, you can usually do a search. In Habitat also carries that on their website. Um, so, there are a lot of resources that you can access. That's a simple search engine, and you put in whatever term it is that that you're you're interested in fair trade or, or organic fabrications, and up will come, or retail, uh, and up will come a, a range of resources for you. So, what fashions, what fashion brands have really become mainstream that you could walk into a Macy's or a or mm -hmm. Nordstrom's or a Bloomingdale's and being able to say, okay, I heard that brand, I'm going to look at that brand. Um, well, in some cases, it's components of a brand. So, for example, Levi's, if you're talking about denim, have done some very interesting things. And then there are entire denim brands like, say, Nudie Jeans out of Sweden, who sell globally, um, whose entire ethos is about organic and recycled and fair and so on. Um, you've got brands like Eden which of course is Ali Hewison's brand married to Bono, whose um, raison d'etre is to sustain um, work through the African continent, a, you know, um, trade not aid. So you can pick up an Eden in a Macy's or a Bloomies or any number of one of those places. Um, as you can Levi's jeans. Um, there are it, it's across multiple tiers of distribution. So if you want to go up market, Alabama Channing, for example, does a, a beautiful product that is also available in, say, Barney's. So a different retail environment and higher end, but just as easy to access, whether online through our website or whether through bricks and mortar or through. And many of the designers have, you know. Most of the designers at this stage have their own e-commerce sites where you can buy directly online or through other online retailers like Net-a-Porte or Ux or uh, Farfetch, etc. It's good to know because I think that that's the, pro the problem is that people, if it's not easy for them, it's, mm -hmm. they just won't do it. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, you've given us, you know, a list, a laundry list, mm -hmm. especially going to your own website to look for those resources is just to make it just easy. Sure. So tell us again your website. It's uh, ecofashiontalk.com. So www.ecofashiontalk.com. And last words, mm -hmm. what kind of advice would you give to people? If you could give them like just like a one or two sentence to with this holiday season coming up, what kind of advice would you give them? I think that Conscious consumerism is absolutely vital as we move ahead and make purchases. We vote with our dollars. We support companies and corporations and CEOs with every single dollar we spend, whether that's for our, the, put the food on our table, to furnish our homes, or to buy gifts or clothing for ourselves and our friends and family. And I think that we should be choosing carefully who we give that money to. We work hard for our dollars and we are supporting companies and corporations through those through our spending habits and I think it behooves all of us to spend our money um, carefully and support those that we believe in as opposed to uh, those that we don't. 
So tell us your two books as we're leaving so they can buy them on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the latest one, Refashioned, which is uh, just been out uh, not even two weeks in, in the US actually um, and that focuses on cutting-edge designers working with upcycled materials and the previous one called Eco Fashion which has uh, much broader content of eco fashion designers working with a multitude of different materials around the world. Very exciting especially for anybody who wants to go into this field they should definitely get your books. Thank you. <laughs> Sass, it's been a pleasure and thank you for enlightening us because I think it's a story that needs to be told and people just with fashion it's just kind of one of those things that no one they kind of cover their ears and they don't want to hear it. Agreed. So, so I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy and to tell us, you know, what to look for in the holidays. And then there's and you gave us a lot of good information as to what kind of products that they can look for and the names and you know where to look for it's just really great information. I really appreciate it. So Thank everybody you. Um, we are going back on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. We have uh, Beth Brzezinski, and she's going to be talking about, Karen, what is Beth going to be talking about? Sharing is good. Sharing is good. Yeah, conscious so, consumerism or, uh, or lack yeah. of consumerism or trying to cut back on consumerism along the same line. So, everybody, we hope to see you next, uh, next week on Tuesday at 2 o'clock, and we'll be with Beth and Sass again. It was a pleasure. Thank you very nice much. Nice meeting you, Sass. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.